Okay, welcome. Um, today it's a honor and pleasure to welcome Daniel Kitzmann from the University of Bern and the um, Center of S for Space and Habitability. Um, we know each other already for a very long time, so we studied both in Berlin and we met in the academic year 2004-2005 where we both <laughs> gave a seminar on photon-dominated regions, so it's already a very long time. Um, after that, we both did our diploma at the Technical University of Berlin um, and was wor were working on ATB stars. I worked on hydrodynamics, he worked on radio transfer. After that, he switched a little bit the field and joined the group of Heike Rauer, which is probably well known for being the PI of Plato, and did his PhD there in the group, also under the supervision of Beate Pazza, and worked on the effects of cloud in planetary atmospheres, and especially um, looking at the climatic effects and the effect on the um, planetary spectra. And in 2014, then, he moved to Bern, where he still is, and joined the group of Kevin Heng, and um, yeah, is working there in the Center of, for Space and Habitability. And today, he will give a talk on the spectral surveys of ultra-hot Jupiters. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Jan, um, and welcome, everybody, to my talk. Um, as Jan mentioned, I will talk about um, Otaho Jupiters. Um, you see an example in the background. This is a nice sunset or sunrise on the exoplanet Kelt 9b. Um, Otaho Jupiters are like a class of exoplanets, and we have detected so far roughly 4,600, mostly from space by transits. So what is shown here is like the, the, the general exoplanet population um, we have the radius in Jupiter radii on the x-axis, the orbital distance and astronomical units on the y-axis, and color-coded uh, temperature. And you can clearly see the different distributions of exoplanets that we have detected so far. So, for example, we have the so-called hot Jupiters, which are like Jovian-like, uh, Jovian-sized planets um, at short orbital distances. Uh, that means they're also quite hot, if you look at the uh, color-coded temperatures. Um, we have the mini-Neptunes. Um, which are roughly a Neptune size or sub-Neptune size. And finally, we have the kind of rocky super-Earth um, at smaller radii. Um, I mostly focus um, in my talk on this population here. And even this population can be further categorized in um, um, different um, planet categories. So what I'm now showing you is the radius again on the y-axis and the equilibrium temperature on the x-axis. Um, you have the hot Jupiters right here, and the sub-Neptunes and um, super Earths right here. And you can see that there are some of those hot Jupiters which are quite different, which are um, Jupiter-sized, so they have roughly one Jupiter radius or slightly larger, but they um, are extremely hot, so they have like temperatures above 2,000 Kelvin. Um, the inner boundary of this region here is not clearly well defined. Um, so people, somebody, uh, sometimes people say this is just a hot Jupiter. If it has 2,000 Kelvin, some people, some people say it's an ultra hot Jupiter. So like the inner boundary of this uh, category is not really well defined. Um, however, like all those planets here, those are the really ultra hot. Thank you. Um, Kelt 9b itself was detected in 2017, so quite recently actually. And it's one of the very few planets that we know around eight type stars. Um, and this one particularly orbits an A0 star. So this A0 star has an equilibrium temperature of like 10,000 Kelvin. Um, the mass and radius is not remarkable, so we have other examples of such a planet. Um, what is remarkable is the orbital distance of 1.6 days around an A0 star. And that means that this planet receives roughly 44,000 times the solar insulation that we uh, receive on Earth. 
and this makes this planet extremely hot. So like the day side temperature are probably, probably in excess of 4,500 Kelvin. Um, the other special thing about this planet is, um, is its orbit, um, because it kind of orbits its central star, Kelvin 9, on an almost like a polar orbit. So basically goes from the North Pole to the South Pole instead of the normal um, equatorial plane. Um, so what this means for the planet where if it's this hot is um, that it probably has no clouds because at these temperatures every condensate will be evaporated. Um, it also means um, that something we have to take into account for cooler planets which is chemical transport. That means chemical species are transported either in the vertical or horizontally. Um, it's probably not important here because the chemical time scales are so fast so the chemical reactions under these temperatures are so fast that this uh, planet might actually be in chemical equilibrium, which is um, a nice thing because chemical equilibrium is quite simple compared to like if you have to solve the entire chemical network and take um, the vertical and horizontal transport into account. Um, now, we became interested in burn um, on Kelton and B because of the Cheops mission. Um, some of you might know who, what Cheops is. Um, it's an um, ESA S class mission, so it's like a small satellite and it has launched like three years ago. Um, it has a 30 centimeter camera um, and only one um, wide bandpass filter on the optical. So this is like the filter that Kops has going from roughly 400 nanometers to about one micron. And what Kops is designed to do is it, uh, it's designed to um, basically um, observe exoplanets to determine their radii uh, to a very good precision. Um, What's interesting about um, Cheops and Cat9 is if we plot the equilibrium camp, the temperature of Cat9, so like the spectral distribution, um, just as a simple Planck function, you see that this directly coincides with the, uh, with the Cheops bandpass. And that means if you point Cheops at this target, you would actually measure the thermal emission of the planet. Um, this makes Cat9 actually a prime target for the Cheops mission. Um, so in like 2018, um, pe people from the, CL, uh, from, the, from the Kiop science team came to me and basically asked me, well, we have identified this nice um, new planet, Kiop 9b, can you tell us anything about it, about like the chemical composition and so on? Well, I said, well, we can have a look at it. Um, so the first thing I looked at was um, how the chemistry changes if you change the temperature. Um, so what is shown here is the mixing ratio of the chemical species, which is like the partial pressure divided by the total pressure. Um, on the vertical axis, we have the temperature. And I always show two different lines. There's one solid line and one dashed line, and those correspond to two different pressures that I computer chemistry for. Um, the solid line is for 10 millibar, with, which is roughly the pressure that we observe um, in a transmission spectrum. And the dashed uh, curve is for 0.1 bar, which is roughly the pressure that we observe in emission. Um, now, what you can see is when we increase the temperature from 2,000 to 4,500, um, hydrogen, what the molecular hydrogen gets dissociated, and the atomic hydrogen takes over. So the atmosphere becomes dominated in atomic hydrogen rather than molecular nitrogen. Um, the other species that we actually didn't really expect was H minus, because this is not a species that we normally uh, would consider for an exoplanet. It's a very important opacity source uh, in stars. Um, but apparently it seems to be present on those hot planets as well. And this, as we will later see, has some important implications for the spectra that we can see from these planets. Um, molecules, for example, water, starts to dissociate at around uh, 2,000 Kelvin, and if you go to like 4,000 and 4,500, so this is like the temperature of Kelvin 9 b it has a mixing ratio of like 10 to the minus 10, which basically makes it unobservable, kind of. Um, other molecules, for example, I oh know, um, the other important ingredients is, of course, atoms, because at these high temperatures, you basically dissociate most of the molecules. And you actually start to actually um, ionize, for example, iron. So the atomic form of iron um, kind of declines the abundance beyond 3,000 Kelvin, and then you see the rise of the iron ion. Um, the only molecule that's still kind of left is CO, because it's the most stable molecule we have. But even that one kind of starts to dissociate at temperatures um, of Cal 9 b um, So the next thing, um, um, when I looked at like, this general chemistry, I was interested in like the actual vertical chemistry, because this is just 
um, the chemistry as a function of temperature for a fixed pressure, but I was interested how does the chemistry on the day set looks like as a function of pressure, so in like the vertical. Um, and for this, you first need a temperature profile. So what I did, I used one of our models that we developed in Bern, which is called the Helios model. Um, that's a 1D atmospheric model for exoplanets. Um, and I just simulated a day side temperature profile, which is shown here on the left. So you have the temperature in Kelvin, the pressure in bar. Um, sorry, it's the other way around. This is temperature, this is pressure, sorry. <laughs> Um, so that means this is like the bottom of the atmosphere, this is the top of the atmosphere. Um, and you uh, can see that Kelton 9b has a very strong temperature inversion. So it has a temperature inversion of almost 2000 Kelvin throughout like the middle um, atmosphere to the top of the atmosphere. And the low atmosphere here is almost isothermal. Um, only if you go to a very, very high pressure, so very deeper down, you would see that it goes back into this like normal adiabat that we know from normal planets. Um, so then I took this temperature profile and I basically plotted or calculated the vertical chemistry, um, which is shown here. So again, we have the pressure on the y-axis, so this is the bottom of the atmosphere, this is the top, and here's again the mixing ratio of chemical species, um, which again is the partial pressure of the species divided by its total pressure. Um, and now we can see that the vertical variation in chemistry is actually quite strong. So like the deep atmosphere is still dominated by molecular hydrogen, um, at around one bar, the atomic hydrogen takes over, and if we go high up into the atmosphere, um, atomic hydrogen um, um, ionizes to H+. Plus. Uh, we have the uh, electron, that means in the upper atmosphere, almost half of the pressure is made by the free electrons, uh, the other one by the at um, hydrogen atom. Um, the other important um, species is again H-, minus which has a kind of high abundance around one bar and then strongly decreases um, because high, uh, H minus needs a little bit higher pressure to form. So it's very easily destructive because it's only like a hydrogen ion, uh, sorry, a hydro hydrogen atom with an additional e uh, electron. So that's not very stable. Um, so you actually need very, um, a lot of like collisions to actually form H minus again. That means it only forms at higher pressures. Uh, molecules, um, as I've shown you in the plot before, basically start to dissociate very early on. So water is basically gone um, above one bar. CO survives a little bit longer, but even here above like 10 to the minus five bar, CO is also almost completely dissociated. Um, what we have instead are of course ions and atoms. So most of the elements here like iron, titanium, sodium, are actually in their um, ionized form. So we have a very high um, iron plus abundance, sodium plus abundance, and titanium plus abundance. So this atmosphere, like the upper atmosphere, is completely dominated by atoms and ions. Um, uh, Ultra Jupiter is um, actually a quite uh, unique chemical laboratory. Uh, because in a normal exoplanet that are much, much cooler, most of those um, atoms would actually be locked in molecules. So you would uh, not be able to see like iron, for example, or iron plus. You would need to search for molecules that contain iron, like FEH. Um, the other problem is that many of those refractory metals are mostly locked in condensates if you go to lower temperatures. That means you can't actually see them anymore. And that means it's very hard to actually get something like the elemental abundance of the atmosphere out of spectra. Um, but this is completely different for ultra Jupiters because here we can actually measure the abundance of iron. We can, for example, measure the abundance of iron plus. If we add it, uh, those two together, we actually get the elemental abundance of iron compared to hydrogen. Um, and this is very important because this allows us to test planet formation theories, for example. Uh, one common assumption in planet formation theories is that those giant planets essentially have the same metallicity as the star because they got the same solar nebula gas. But this, of course, has never been tested because for the normal planets, um, as I've said, you can't really measure the iron abundance. Um, so the question is, um, can we actually measure something from the stuff that I just showed you? So what I did um, as a next step, I just calculated spectra. Uh, so, sorry, uh, first I need to talk to you very briefly about uh, two different observation methods that I common, uh, commonly use for exoplanets. Um, at least for like transiting exoplanets. So one is a secondary eclipse. The secondary eclipse occurs when the planet here moves behind the star. 
Um, just before the secondary eclipse, what you would observe from the system is the day-site emission of the star, uh, of the star uh, sorry, the emission of the star plus the day-site emission of the planet. But once the planet is behind the star, um, it get the, the flux of the, uh, of the system gets reduced by the day-site emission. And that means you measure like a smaller flux when the planet is behind the star. And this eclipse depth um, is directly related um, to the thermally um, em emitted flux of the planetary day side divided by the stellar flux. Um, the other observ uh, observational um, thing we can have is, that, of course, the transit. This is when the planet moves in front of the star. And here, um, the starlight that is basically channeled through the planet's atmosphere gets partially absorbed or scattered. And that means that um, at a specific wavelength where the planet um, absorbs radiation, it appears to be a little bit larger. And so we basically can measure in transit um, a wavelength, depend, uh, wavelength dependent transit radius of the planet with a transit depth that is basically given by the radius of the planet, which is wavelength dependent divided by the stellar radius. Um, both observations trace um, different parts of the planet. Um, the secondary eclipse mostly looks at the day side, so basically this part here, whereas the transit looks more at the terminator region of the planet. Um, so then I basically took like all this chemistry output that I got for the planet, the TP profile, and I started to simulate the spectra of this KL9b planet. So what is shown here is the day side secondary eclipse, so F planet divided by F star in PPM over wavelength. Um, and here you can see that basically you have all those like atomic absorption lines. In this case, they're actually emission lines because of this strong temperature inversion. Um, the big problem, of course, is that we can't really observe such a high resolution spectrum from space, for example, um, because we don't have any high resolution spectrographs in space. Um, the, the best instrument we currently still have is the HST, and for the HST, the spectrum would look like this. Um, so the HST, at least the wide field camera, uh, camera three on the HST, is limited for, um, from one micron to about um, 1.7 micron at a rather low spectral resolution. I mean, you still so see some features in here, um, but, unfor uh, but unfortunately those are not features from the planet. This is actually um, the feature from the stellar spectrum. So if, if I approximate, instead of a full stellar spectrum, if I approximate the star by a black body, so like this um, flux that you divide uh, this thing by, by just a simple black body, you see that all the features are gone. So it's basically a nice flat line. Um, this thing happens uh, simply because um, this is again the day side spectrum now, this, so this is just the flux of the planet. So the, all those uh, emission lines here um, are only observed at high resolution. If you bin the spectrum down to a lower resolution, which I've done here with this blue curve, you see that at least beyond 0.5 micron, this looks essentially like a black body. So there's nothing really to observe. Um, so emission air spectroscopy doesn't really work, apparently, at least not at low resolution. So what about transmission? Um, essentially, it's the same. So here I simulated a, trans a transmission spectrum for a terminator temperature of 4,000 Kelvin, again, as a function of temperature. In the background, you see the, um, the spectrum at high resolution. And if you bin the resolution down, this is what you get, like a nice flat line. Um, again, we can, um, and the reason for this is actually um, the strong H minus opacity. So what I did here in the yellow curve is I artificially removed H minus from the calculation and recalculated the spectrum. And now you can suddenly see spectral features. So you see like the famous Rayleigh slope at uh, smaller wavelengths. This here is actually water or the little remaining water that there is. And we actually also have some CO bands. So we have CO here and this is also another CO band over there. So the problem is, um, um, problem is actually the H minus that makes the spectrum completely flat because the H minus, because the H minus opacity is so strong. Um, this is again an, another um, simulation what the HST would see in transmission for different temperatures. And you can see if you go above 2000 Kelvin, you measure basically flat lines. Um, if you go to 2000 Kelvin, you see this nice water feature again. Um, the problem is that Kelvin 9 is probably more like in this regime rather than this one here. So that means um, observing this planet from space is probably not a good idea because all you would measure is flat lines. Um, so what have you learned so far? Um, the hydrogen anions, so H minus, and the lack of molecule 
um, makes it very difficult to study the chemical composition, at least from space. Um, and low resolution spectroscopy doesn't really help in constraining the chemistry of this planet at all. Uh, at all. Um, that means we need to go to actually to a higher resolution spectra in order to see anything. Um, this, of course, can only be done from the ground. And CAT9 is in the northern hemisphere, so you can't use the telescopes, for example, in Chile. Um, what we have on the northern hemisphere um, is um, the so-called Harps North spectrograph, which is the copy of the Harps spectrograph that's actually in La Silla. And Harps North is um, located on the ESO Observatory in La Palma. It's a high-resolution spectrograph built actually in Geneva, so by my, friend, uh, by my um, Geneva colleagues. Um, it has a spectral resolution of roughly 100,000, so it has a very nice high resolution. Uh, the wavelength range that was limited is only from like 380 nanometers to roughly 700 nanometers. Um, so the first thing, of course, is the question, what kind of species do you want to observe? Um, if you remember from the chemistry plots I've shown you before, iron seems to be a very good candidate because it's apparently very abundant in this planet. And as we also know from stars, iron has a very uh, rich spectrum. So I basically calculated the high resolution spectrum um, of iron um, for calc 9 b which is shown here, um, for the Harps spectral range. So this only goes from 400 nanometers to roughly 700 nanometers. And you can see here all those absorption lines from iron and iron plus. The problem, of course, is if you want to observe this with a high, resol a high resolution spectrograph, this is not what you actually measure. Um, but unfortunately, I'm only a poor theoretician. I'm not an observer, so I need to, uh, needed to get help from colleagues. And one special colleague was uh, Jens Huimakas. Um, he's re he recently moved to Lund Observatory to become an assistant professor, but at that time he was a shared postdoc between Bern and Geneva. And he's an observer and um, a specialist in high resolution spectroscopy. So what I did is I basically gave him this high resolution spectrum and asked him whether he could simulate a Harps um, observation with it. Well, he did, and he came back with this black thing over here. Um, now, you might think that all those lines that you see here in the simulated spectrum, those are like those iron lines. Um, but this is actually not the case. What you actually see there is noise. Um, the spectrum, if you plot it here in red, this is the spectrum that's hidden in the noise. So the noise in this high, res high resolution spectrum is by a factor of 100 or 1,000 higher than the signal that we actually want to extract. Um, so we can't really, unless a line is very, very strong, for example, the calcium H and K lines usually are so strong that they kind of come out of the noise. For iron, you basically don't see anything in the spectrum directly, so you can't directly point at a specific iron line. Um, however, there are some techniques um, that you can use to basically retrieve the information of the presence of iron or iron plus. And this is the cross-correlation technique that Jens applied to this data set. Um, so the cross-correlation technique is basically a statistical technique, and what it effect effectively does is um, the following. So as, um, let's assume you have a um, ground-true spectrum. So this is like the spectrum you assume the planet has, which is uh, in the background here in black. This is, of course, not what you observe. What you observe are those blue scattered points because of all the noise. Um, now what you can do is you can create a so-called template, which is a spectrum um, that you think the planet looks like. For example, if I want to detect iron, this would be a spectrum that contains the iron lines. And what I then do is we calculate the cross-correlation function, which is given here, which is just simply the summation of all those spectral points um, of the measured flux, which, is, which are those scattered blue points, times the template divided by the sum of the template to normalize it a bit. And what it effectively does is it basically sums over all the measured data points. And since there are so many points, you can actually kind of beat down the noise to actually get down a sensible cross-correlation signal. Um, one problem, of course, is that the planet is not standing still uh, because uh, while it's transiting, it's actually moving. So all the iron lines in the spectrum or any other absorption lines are constantly blue or red shifted. Um, and that's why we can't directly apply this cross-correlation function because we don't know the exact radial velocity of the planet at any given time. 
So what we do is we actually calculate this cross correlation function for different radial velocities. So what we do is we basically shift this template in radial velocity space. Then we calculate this uh, cross correlation function for every um, radial velocity. And when those two temp uh, when those two spectra basically match up, you see that there's a large peak in a cross correlation function. And this basically tells you now that this template that you were looking for is basically contained within this blue mess that you see here. So you basically have reduced like those 200 data points into like a single peak. Um, obviously this can't tell, doesn't tell you everything, it just tells you that the template that you cross collected for is included. It doesn't give you like any abundance or anything. Um, normally, um, when we observe the transit of a planet, we don't only have one spectrum, but we observe multiple spectra during the transit. Normally, it's like 20 different spectra inside the transit and, and another dozen outside of the transit. Um, so what we actually have is we don't only have one um, spectrum, but we actually have, if you think this is like the time axis, we have like, let's say, 100 different spectra. And for each of these spectra, we do this cross-correlation. And because the planet is moving um, during the start of the transit, the planet is coming basically towards the observer. So that means all the uh, lines are blue shifted. In mid-transit, um, the planet has a radial velocity of zero. So then you are in the rest frame of the planet. And in the second half of the transit, the planet is uh, moving away from the observer, which means all the lines are red shifted. And that means if we now apply this cross correlation function to every exposure, so this is like um, exposure one, so the first spectrum, this is the 120 spectrums. You can also see this as a time axis. So this here would be the start of the transit, this is the end. And if we now perform this cross correlation function um, for every exposure, you see that like this peak in a cross correlation function, of course, is has like a slanted feature. Again, because um, in the first part is blue shifted and the other one is red shifted, and the angle of this feature is actually proportional to the orbital, orbital velocity of the planet. Um, so what Jens did, he basically um, uh, made a simulated top ob uh, Hobbs observation, used this template to cross correlate with this um, black mass here, and what he got was this theoretical signal of an iron detection. So in my paper in 2018, which was like a theoretical study, we basically confirmed or we estimated that a single transit would be enough to observe iron in cat 9 b because iron has such a strong spectral signature here. Um, two days after we submitted this paper, um, Jens went back to his colleagues in Geneva and he told them about this nice planet and whether they actually could observe it because the half snow spectrum was, was, was built in Geneva. Um, and the supervisor in um, Geneva, David Ehrenreich, basically told him, oh, well, actually, I have this thing here in my drawer. Um, what, is, um, what is this is actually um, transmission spectrum of cat 9 b taken almost a year before we wrote our study. Um, our colleagues in Geneva were only interested in finding atomic hydrogen um, because they were interested in seeing whether this planet is like evaporating. But in a single transit, they couldn't find it, so they put it back into their drawers and they were waiting for a second transit. Um, so what is shown here is, yeah, as I've said, is a transmission spectrum or a series of transmission spectra of cat 9 b taken by the Hubs North instrument. Um, on the vertical, oh, sorry, on the, on the horizontal axis, um, you have basically pixel or wavelength. And on the vertical, you have time or like exposure. So in total, I think you have uh, 100 different spectra, um, 20 of which are, I think, in transit and the other ones are out of transit. Um, now this, of course, is only the raw data, so you can't really use this. You have to like post-process it. Um, the first thing you notice is that during the transit, you see this variation in flux, which should not occur, which is just simply due to the Earth atmosphere constantly changing. So what you do is you basically have to normalize the spectrum to make it basically even uh, in time. And now you see those nice yeah, um, absorption lines here, but those are not, not actually absorption lines from the planet. This is actually the Earth atmosphere that you would need to remove, for example, water, or ozone or oxygen. And once this is done, you end up with like the actual transmission spectrum. And as you can see, there's not a lot of structure in there. It's just points. Um, and what Jens just simply did, he just used this template we used in my paper. He cross-correlated with it, and there was iron. 
Um, so this is like the two-dimensional cross-correlation function. You see, kind of can see the slanted feature here. Um, this slanted feature is not always very obvious, so what you actually do is you integrate over the entire transit to calculate like the average one-dimensional cross-correlation function which is given here. So this is like averaged over the entire transit, and now you can see that there's this nice iron peak in a cross-correlation function that tells you that iron is actually um, in this planet. And this was, um, in fact, the first detection of atomic iron um, in an exoplanet. Um, since we have found iron plus uh, iron, uh, we also uh, searched obviously for iron plus. And the other important absorber in stellar atmospheres is titanium and titanium plus, so we also search for those. Um, you can see this very nice feature of iron plus, which is uh, actually a very strong um, detection. Uh, we don't see anything for atomic titanium, but we also found um, the titanium ion, also a very strong detection. So those were like the first detection of iron, iron plus, and titanium plus in an exoplanet atmosphere, uh, which was published in 2018 um, in Nature. Um, little afterwards, um, our colleagues in Geneva finally got their second transit observation of Kelton 9 b um, Again, the PI was David Ehrenreich, um, and Jens basically combined the two different uh, data sets and confirmed the detection of iron, um, iron plus and titanium plus. But then, of course, the question we had is, can we actually detect more? And what, um, what can we actually detect? Or what should we look for? So we just had a look at the periodic table, um, and we just decided to look for everything that we have data for. So everything here in red is stuff we kind of tried to cross-correlate for. So we went all the way up to, like, uranium. And everything in white just means there is no chemical or lineless data available to do any cross-correlation with. Um, that actually gave us a little bit of headache, because normally if we model exoplanets, we usually stop at, like, yttrium or, like, vanadium or stuff like that. So we don't have stuff like uranium, cerium, anything like that in our models. So we actually had to gather all the data um, to include it in our chemistry, and it also we also had to assemble the line list, calculate the opacities, and so on and so on. Um, so in total, we included, like for example, 100 new species in our equilibrium chemistry. We had to calculate 300 different um, opacities, for example. And then uh, we calculated the templates. Um, the templates itself is actually quite easy. Um, so what we do is we first um, calculate a transmission spectrum with a single line forming species. For example, in this case, it's calcium and some continuum species. So you see like the continuum absorption. So this is like the transmission spectrum, again, as a function of wavelength. Um, this is like the spectral continuum, which is given by H minus uh, collision induced absorption of H to H2 and H2 helium. And you see those lines of calcium. Um, in the next step, we calculate the second transmission spectrum just of the background observers, which gives us like this um, smooth or uh, yeah, continuous underground, which is given here. So what you uh, actually can see here, this is the H minus opacity feature. And then we just simply subtract the two. So what we do is basically we subtract the continuum out of this spectrum here, which then gives us this final template. And the template just gives you essentially um, the height of the line above the stellar uh, uh, above of the planet's continuum, where the continuum now sits at zero. And we did these calculations for all the species that we want to do with the cross-correlation for, and then we just cross-correlated um, all the different species. Um, here are some examples of the templates. Um, so, for example, iron obviously has a very rich template, but there are other species, for example, like potassium, which only has a single line. And the potassium ion, for example, has no lines at all. So you can't actually detect all the species you want to have. You can only detect the species that have major contributions in the Harps North uh, band pass. Um, yeah, so we tested out all those different species here, and what we found in the end was those two, uh, two combined transits where, um, where are you? Next slide, yeah, sorry. Um, we have sodium, um, atomic form, we have magnesium, we have scandium too. Um, titanium two, this is the one we already had from the from last time. We had chromium two, um, we have yttrium two, and we have iron one and iron two also from the previous detection already. Um, on the left hand side, you see again those one dimensional cross correlation functions which have been averaged over the entire transit. Um, this is the one in black, and the one in red, so the dotted line in red, this is the estimated signal if we believe that the spectra or the templates we calculated 
are the actual spectrum of the planet, so the actual truth. Um, you see that in many cases, the template basically underestimates the cross-correlation signal, except for things like iron, for example. So for example, if we look at iron, we see that the predicted signal here in red um, is actually quite a good match to the observed one. But if you go to iron plus, we underestimate the absorption that should occur by a factor of eight to 10. Um, that could have different reasons. For example, it could mean that the planet has an increased metallicity because increased metallicity means you have more metal, uh, more metal that means you have more ions. Um, it could mean we have a higher temperature than the one we have used for the templates. We could also be looking at some non-LTE effects because under such a high or strong irradiation from an A-type star, you might have non-LTE non effects in the upper atmosphere. Or maybe we see um, enrichment of the upper atmosphere by evaporation so that like metals from the lower atmosphere are slowly diffusing upwards. Um, what we can also see is um, that there is no profile asymmetry. So if you look at those uh, measured cross-correlation functions here, you see that they're almost Gaussian. Uh, so there's no, no, uh, there's basically no asymmetry here, which means that there's, n there's no evidence, at least for Kelvin 9, of a strong day-night wind, because that would actually shift um, the cross-correlation peaks. And there's also no tail-like evaporation flow that our uh, Geneva colleagues were looking for. Um, we also have some more candidates, um, which we don't claim as detection because they are like one-dimensional cross-correlation functions look a bit weird. So in the two-dimensional ones, you don't see anything. Um, but here you see some features which, I mean, they are not completely Gaussian. Um, they, are, they look a bit weird. That's why we don't claim them as detection. But it could be like chromium-1, calcium-1, cobalt-1, nickel-1, and SR-2. Um, so if you now look at the periodic table of CALT-9, so all the species we have found so far, um, those are the ones in green. And the ones in orange are the ones that we consider to be <coughs> candidates. Um, previous papers have already detected atomic hydrogen. So this was a nature paper by Jan and Henning. And um, in addition to us, Corley et al. also found magnesium, but not by using cross correlation, but they also, they only looked at the one, at one specific very strong magnesium line. So they made actually a direct detection without cross correlation. Um, yeah, so, so much about uh, CALT-9. Now I'm coming to, um, as a second example, to another old, old contributor, which lives roughly on the other side of this range, which is called WASP-1-to-1b. Um, WASP-1-to-1 um, is also, from its mass and radius, not very exciting. It's like a normal hot Jupiter. Um, it has an uh, orbital period of 1.3 days, so it's shorter than uh, CALT-9, um, but it only orbits in F six main sequence star. So it's not as hot. It only has a daisy temperature of roughly 2,000 Kelvin, so not those 4,000. Um, in contrast to Kelvin 9 b there actually has been space data for WASP-1-to-1b measured by the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitz and Kepler. And the people who, who analyzed the data, um, including me, uh, which is of course low, low resolution data. So what we found is we found like a moderate temperature inversion, so not like this crazy 2,000 Kelvin inversion that we have for Kelvin 9 and we found that water is apparently decreased from the amount that you would expect. So we assume that there's some kind of photo dissociation going on. Um, Jens, um, in one of his observation programs, obtained three uh, Harps trends, so this time from uh, the southern hemisphere. And he again um, looked for species at higher resolution. So he did all those template matching again. And th those here are just the results. So he detected um, atomic magnesium, calcium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, iron, and nickel. Um, there were no, detection of, of, uh, no detections of ions, so only atoms. And he, only tried, he also tried to cross-correlate for molecules, uh, which, are, which we assume to be present there. So we have SH, which resulted in no detection. There's no water detection at high resolution. There is no VO. Um, but if you see at those um, red predicted curves. Um, so this is like the cross correlation signal that we would expect. You see that we also wouldn't expect to see anything. Um, it's different for TIO because here we would have expected to actually see a cross correlation signal if TIO was there, but we didn't see anything. So apparently TIO is not in this high, res high resolution spectrum. Um, and this is simply probably due to, I mean, um, both um, TIO, um, TIO is absent um, as well as the atomic um, titanium 
and the titanium ion is also not present. Um, and due to the rather low temperatures, we just think that TiO might be already condensed out, uh, whereas something like vanadium is still in the gas phase because titanium oxide and vanadium, they, um, I think, their condensation curves differ by like 100 or 200 Kelvin. Um, so we think that titanium here is already condensed out while vanadium is still in the gas phase. Um, again, we have no detection of molecules. Um, and some species are again underpredicted by our models. So if we look here, for example, we constantly underpredict what happens um, with those species, except for, for example, titanium one. I uh, know this was a low detection. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so much for was one to one B. Um, what I'm going to sh show you now is another planet which I unfortunately can't name yet uh, because this is a paper that's currently under review uh, in Nature. Um, and here we actually detect for the first time, it's also an ultra Jupiter, and here we also detect for the first time ever um, TIO at high resolution um, combined with atomic titanium, titanium plus, iron, iron plus. Um, we also have chromium, magnesium, vanadium, and manganese. Um, the other interesting thing about this planet is um, that the cross co uh, correlation functions seem to shift if you go from one species to the other. So for example, you see like this feature is um, moved downwards in space compared to that one. And we see that, uh, and we suspect that this might be due to uh, winds on the planet. So that some of those species are so high up or so farther down that they are blue or red shifted compared to other species. Uh, but this is a paper that hope we, hopefully will come out soon. Um, yeah, so my take home message is that ultra Jupiters are very interesting chemical laboratories because they allow us to study basically the gas phase in the atomic and ionic form. Um, it allows for the detection of many elements, many of which you can't detect from space at low resolution. For example, like iron, yttrium, and so on. Um, and kelp 9 b and wasp 1 to 1b, so the one that I showed you are actually currently the exoplanets with the most detected species. Um, one problem, of course, is that at the moment we can only detect the, the presence of a species. We cannot yet convert this cross correlation function to an abundance, so we can't really say how much iron is there, how much iron plus is there, so we can actually compute the elemental bonds of iron. So this is still ongoing work on how to basically convert this cross correlation function into an abundance. This is still ongoing work that we're doing in Bern. Yeah, and thank you all for attending and I'll take questions. Um, yes, so the question was whether uh, SIO could be present. Um, I think we tested for it. Um, the problem is the, I think it doesn't have enough lines in the Harps wavelength range to actually be able to see it. Um, the other problem we always have is that the line lists are sometimes not good enough to do the cross correlation because um, you need to have a very precise um, um, line positions. And for many molecules, that's not really an option. For example, VO is one of those line lists which are terribly, they, the line positions are like shifted by whatever, so we can't really detect it. And SIO, I'm not sure, I think we tested for it, um, but we haven't found it yet. Yeah, um, yeah, so the question was um, if this maybe detections here that I showed show any signs of like winds. Um, the problem with those distributions is you see that they are not really gauche and they are some, yeah, they, they don't look like the other clear detections. Um, and so far, um, I think Jens even combined with a third transit now and I think they are still candidates 
And I think some of them even dropped out because we actually get a flat line. So we, at the moment, we just think that this might just be noise and not anything that we, and not, not anything real, I guess. Um, I mean, we definitely use single species templates because we are interested in detection of single species. Uh, you can, of course, have a template that includes all the species and do cross-correlation. Um, so, for example, what, what, um, what the, the, the guy who observed kelp 9b the first time, he cross-correlated with a stellar spectrum. And you also got a cross-correlation peak, of course, because all those elements that are in the star are also in the planet. Um, there are definitely blending effects. Um, we, if you have enough lines, that doesn't really matter. It only matters if you have a species that only has like five, six different lines. Um, what you can also do is, um, what we also sometimes do is we select um, only specific wavelengths regions where we know that this species um, has the most prominent lines. Um, or we also create, um, this is uh, uh, stuff that I'm currently working on, we also create like binary masks. Um, which is we just record the line positions and there we check actually for blending effects So we uh, check whether in the spectrum that contains all the species whether this line is actually present or whether it has been Submerged in a line wing of another species But so far as we have seen this is rarely the case actually it's only very few lines that are affected by that most of the lines are actually separated to a, to a degree where you can do cross correlation apparently Um, yes. Uh, in, not in my code. <laughs> um, there are people working on on the inter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So the question was um, about the interactions of the planet with the host star, because there should be some radiation driven winds which could impact the planet. Um, there are people studying this, and apparently this planet is like slowly leaking, especially hydrogen. Um, but of course it has so much hydrogen left um, that it takes a long time to actually see changes in the elemental abundances. Um, at the moment the big problem is that we can detect the species, we can't really um, get the abundance out, which would be actually be a nice thing to then compare against the metallicity of the host star to see whether there is already any change, but we are not there yet. But there should definitely be an impact of like solar wind or escape or whatever, definitely. Mm -hmm. So is that relative to stellar uh, well, rel relative to hydrogen. Okay, so relative to hydrogen. Yeah, and of course relative to the star as well, because um, we assume that, I think Kelton-9b is pretty much solar metallicity anyway, like the central star is solar metallicity almost. 
Um, for those cross correlations here, so for Cal 9 b we actually made a huge grid in terms of temperature and metallicity. It turns out that metallicity doesn't really matter if you do cross correlation, you get still the signal out. Um, so our idea was we tried to fit like this cross correlation peak here when uh, if we increase the metallicity. Um, the problem is even at like 1000 solar metallicity we couldn't fit this peak and the problem is if you go beyond that um, the mean, mean molecular weight of the atmosphere starts to increase. So you actually start to collapse the atmosphere again a bit and this means that the signal would also degrade. <laughs> So we did tests with uh, different metallicities, but so far we didn't find anything. <laughs> yeah. um, so the question was um, how much, how high the signal to noise ratio has to be in order to do this. Uh, I mean, we have Harps North, uh, what have we have, we have, I think we have roughly 600 signal noises. If we combine the uh, multiple transits, it gets higher. But this is roughly like a normal high resolution spectrum you can measure from the ground, I guess. Um, okay, so the question was whether if the planet is rotating fast, whether we can have two cross correlation peaks. Um, hmm. I mean, it needs. I mean, I mean, the transit only takes like an hour or whatever. So I'm not sure if it would impact um, the cross correlation function itself. I think. Um, I think it's more, um, I think you ha have more effect if you have something that's unevenly distributed on a terminator. So if you have different species on the morning terminator than on the evening one, which is what we actually see in this last example that I showed you of the unnamed planet. Um, I think rotation itself, I don't think you can rotate it that fast. Um, what you definitely can have is winds. So you actually see like a cross collation shift if we have like winds in the atmosphere because that also shifts the, um, the line peaks. Um, but this I think would only lead to like a deformation of your CCF. I think, mm, I don't think that you would have two peaks, but I'm not sure, I never simulated that. <laughs> but good question. Um, yeah, so the question was about the new space telescopes, um, like the James Webb, I guess. Um, I mean, there are two problems. Uh, of course, the resolution of James Webb's not high enough to do this. Um, the other thing, at least for Cal 9, is Cal 9 is too bright. <laughs> it saturates uh, the James Webb detectors like in a millisecond. <laughs> so we can't observe it with James Webb. So the only thing we can do, at least for Cal 9, um, I think was one to one as well, is from the ground. Oh no, sorry, not what, not, not was one to one because that one can be observed from space, but Cal 9 definitely is only from ground. If the HSD dies. Yeah, okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, the problem is NASA doesn't even allow us to, to point it <laughs> at Kelt 9. <laughs> I guess it was too expensive to build. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, tightly locked, yes. It's tightly locked. Yes. It probably causes winds, yes, um, but not with, with wind speeds that at least in the cross correlation function we can at the moment detect. Maybe with more data we might be able to detect it. But there definitely should be winds, of course. Okay. Thank you.